Hello, everyone, and welcome. I hope you all are having a, a good week here at KubeCon. Today, we're going to be talking about DoorDash's migration from StatsD to Prometheus with over 10 million metrics per second. Before we get started, I wanted to just do a quick poll of the room. Um, how many people here work at companies that use StatsD? Okay. What about Prometheus? All right. And what about both? Okay. <laughs> All right. Try to catch some people in the middle of their migration, right? Um, cool. So my name is Ben Raskin. I'm a solutions architect at Chronosphere, where I work on customer enablement and onboarding. Chronosphere is a, an observability company that focus on, focuses on cloud-native companies. Um, prior to Chronosphere, I was a software engineer at Uber working on M3, uh, an open source metrics platform. Hey, everyone. I'm Emma. Um, I joined DoorDash for about three and a half years ago um, after graduating from Carnegie Mellon University. Um, now I'm in our co-infrastructure observability team and I help the whole organization to migrate from Statsy platform to Prometheus based monitoring. Cool, so just a bit of an agenda. Um, we're first gonna look at some of the challenges that DoorDash faced with StatsD. We'll take a look at how Prometheus resolved those. Uh, next, we'll talk about the client-side migration effort um, from StatsD to Prometheus. Uh, next, we'll talk about enablement, sort of how we got you know, the, the end users and, and engineers and service teams up to speed. Um, and then finally, we'll do a bit of a retro, looking at some of the learnings and, and key results of this, of this gigantic task. So we wanted to begin by talking about some of the challenges that DoorDash faced with StatsD. So a lack of naming standardization and limited support for tags makes it hard to give context and meaning to underlying StatsD metrics. So we can see here we have two, two metrics here coming from two different services. They're both tracking the same thing, the number of page views. But unless you have intimate knowledge of these services and the metrics that they're producing, it's hard to know, right? That these, two, that these two metrics are in fact tracking the same thing. We'll see in a bit with, with tags um, and labels uh, in Prometheus, it's much easier to give context uh, to these particular underlying time series. Next, the number of metrics scales with user traffic in StatsD. This means if the number of user requests um, or traffic to the overall business goes up, the number of metrics go up. Not necessarily, the vo not necessarily the cardinality or unique number of metrics, but the total volume. This oftentimes re requires the need for an aggregation tier before actually storing the, the metrics in the time series database. Otherwise, these metrics can grow exponentially. Next, because StatsD is sent over UDP, there's the potential for packet loss. This is particularly problematic, especially during high traffic uh, times when the server has the, has the opportunity to get overwhelmed, and therefore you could be dropping uh, important data points. Next, uh, the way that StatsD reports counters is, is uh, by deltas. Um, the, the biggest issue with delta counters is there's no way to interpolate missing data points. So once, once you know, the, the server drops the metrics because of you know, packet loss or, or so, some other reason why, um, you know, why you would lose these, uh, these particular counters, there's no way to actually estimate um, or, or interpolate those missing data points. And finally, uh, the lack of histograms in StatsD uh, requires the need to pre-compute pre percentiles um, for, for latencies. Um, and the, the biggest issue with, uh, with pre-computing percentiles is that when you want to aggregate them at query time, it's mathematically uh, nearly impossible to get an accurate uh, representation of the, of the aggregated view. So why Prometheus? Um, based on the issues and pain points we experienced in the StatsD platform, we set some new observability requirements and principles. Um, first, we have a strong preference of using open source. Um, the, the advantages include, um, firstly, it is more cost efficient compared to building and maintaining everything from scratch by ourselves. Uh, secondly, in terms of the um, integration, we can make use of the open source uh, data formats and, and uh, open source query languages. Lastly, using open source can prevent vendor locking, which means that we can consider self-hosting in the future. 
Second, we want more governance and control on the whole monitoring system. We want standard conventions. For example, the standard for common tax and metrics naming conventions. The common tax can be used both for alerts and dashboards, especially for a dashboard it can be using for grouping and filtering. Also, we want to improve the um, governance and the control on the cost side. If we have the ability to break down the usage by um, team and service and organization, then we can set a quota and also really limit um, the team and the service level. The last requirement is about self-service and productivity empowerment. So for new services, we want um, the metrics can be automatically uh, discovered and collected using the current metrics pipeline. We don't want extra work. Also, we want to automate the process of generating basic dashboards and alerts. This is very important to accelerate the migration and onboarding process. Cool, so why did DoorDash choose Prometheus? So first of all, Prometheus has emerged as the dominant standard for open source metrics and it aligned well with DoorDash's organizational strategy and requirements. First of all, the simple fact that there's a ton of community support out there really helped alleviate a lot of the pressure on the central observability team. Um, since now, you know, end users can, could go to you know, Stack Overflow and GitHub and all these other resources um, online to, to get the, the answers to their questions as opposed to having the bottleneck on a central observability team. Next, the query language. PromQL has become the standard um, with regards to querying time series data. Um, so again, this helped. This really helped um, uh, onboarding of new engineers. Um, since now, you you know, since now we have this uh, kind of standard query language, and it's not proprietary at all. Um, and so you can sort of bring those skills right to different companies. The tag-based uh, metric ingestion format allows you to give context and meaning to the underlying time series, and there's several advantages of this. One, of, one advantage that I wanted to highlight uh, with regards to DoorDash is now it's with a tag-based model, it's super easy to see how many metrics um, each service or each team is sending, um, uh, is sending to the platform. Um, and so this makes it really easy to do cost accounting. Next, uh, because Prometheus is a pull-based system, this allows for client-side aggregation. So you no longer have this, uh, you no longer have this uh, worry of your metric traffic uh, scaling with your, with your actual you know, business or, or user traffic. Next, uh, strong support. Um, the, the, there's strong support for the more fundamental tools in DoorDash with, um, with Prometheus. Um, you know, things like Kubernetes and, and Envoy. Um, they really play well um, uh, nicely with, uh, with Prometheus. And then finally, um, Prometheus has you know, obviously native support for histograms uh, such that you, know, you don't need to pre-compute percentiles um, and you can accurately aggregate um, uh, histograms at query time. Um, and then lastly, um, Prometheus uh, reports counters as cumulative counters or running counters. And I wanted to dive into this point just a little bit more, um, just ta talking a little bit uh, about the sort of the visual uh, representation differences between delta counters and, and running counters. So we see here with delta counters, um, when you lose a data point, it's lost forever. Um, there's no way to know what that data point might have been. Um, with running counters or, or cumulative counters, because they're monotonically increasing, um, you can apply uh, a special rate function in PromQL to interpolate or, or estimate what that data point would have been. Okay, let's see what we have done uh, in the client-side migration. Um, for the metrics generation part, I will first introduce the custom metrics, then the PromQL exporters that we have used. Lastly, it's about shell lab the jobs. For custom metrics, including the application and the service metrics, we suggest the uh, service owner and the microservices to use PromQL's native libraries to generate metrics. Uh, one interesting case that I want to share with you guys is that um, the Python client with a multi-process pattern rather than a multi-thread pattern. As we know, um, the PromQL's native client pr presume a multi-thread pattern, which means the metrics can be shared within the workers. 
However, from the multi-process pattern, we discover that um, the measures can be incomplete or require custom implementation with unsorted LPS impact. So to overcome the um, performance penalty, we use Stasi exporter for this part of metrics. Also, we provide some internal libraries for the developers to use and for their uh, flexibility. For example, we provide the uh, internal library to generate HTTP and gRPC metrics automatically. Also, the JVM uh, Prometheus exporter is used in .dash Docker-based images to export the JVM metrics. For some other cases and metrics, uh, we also use um, the open source exporters. The, uh, the community of um, Prometheus is so big and it provides and maintains so many um, use for uh, open source exporters. For example, um, the, the AWS Core, which is uh, metrics, there are many two exporters. The first one is the official Prometheus exporter and the second one is YC exporter. Um, the difference of the two exporters uh, is the uh, different APIs used in their code functions. And we choose the latter one because it have a better um, search discovery mechanism and also have less load on APIs. Also, we, ha we use Stasty uh, exporters and Stasty is still alive in our monitoring system. Uh, there are many two cases that we uh, use uh, Stasi exporter. The first one is that for the latency system that cannot be migrated to Prometheus, we use Stasi exporter for that part of metrics. Uh, the second use case is, uh, as I mentioned before, for the Python client with a multi um, process pattern, we use Stasi exporters to convert the metrics from that to Prometheus and then um, start forward forwarding them to the backend. Also, we use JVM exporters, Node exporters, Kafka like exporters, and the PG Bouncer exporters. These are many uh, used for the infrastructure and platform related metrics. For the short life the jobs that cannot be uh, scrapped by the metrics collector, we use the Prometheus aggregation gateway with a small modification for that part of metrics. To better control the metrics, we have some uh, standard tags for all the metrics. The common tags include, first, the service, which is the service name, um, second, the app, which is uh, the application name. Uh, one service can include multi-different apps. Also, we have Kubernetes cluster, which is to indicate um, the cluster that the service is running on. And environment label is used to uh, differentiate the production and the staging environment. Also, we have the sub environment, which is used to differen differentiate the um, canary uh, sandbox with other environments. The region and zone are AWS terminologies, and they are used to indicate the um, region and the zone ID that the service is deployed in. Lastly, we have cost origin, which is used to analyze the metrics cost uh, attribution. As you can see in the dashboard, uh, uh, there's a screenshot which shows one of the, our dashboard. Uh, in the header, we have um, the common tags uh, in the drop-down list for filtering. Next is about server discovery. Server discovery is used to find and discover the jobs or uh, services for scrapping. Uh, it is done through Kubernetes anno an annotations, which tell Prometheus what endpoints to scrap. Um, the central observability team created a uh, gold standard Kubernetes manifest template, which the service team can use. At Doordash, we have the service template, which is to help the developer to generate the Kubernetes manifest automatically. So after the service owner or the service team added an annotation, which means their um, jobs or services is ready for scrapping. Um, we also deployed the metrics collector as agent. Um, in the Kubernetes cluster, which means that for every node, there will be one um, uh, metrics collector uh, to scrap all the metrics on that node. 
also for the service that are not deployed in the Kubernetes environment, we deploy the matrix character as set car with the service, which means that um, the matrix character will collect the matrix from that service automatically and forward them to the back end. The default uh, scrap options are also defined by the COT team, uh, which means that uh, the scrap options, including like uh, scrap frequency, scrap timeout, and so on, um, are this kind of config configurations are included uh, in the uh, in in the um, in the service collector. Also, we populate the standard labels in the matrix collector uh, for all the metrics. Uh, the standard labels, as I I described in the previous slides. Cool. So during this migration, um, it, it also coincided with hyper growth at DoorDash, um, mainly accelerated by the pandemic. Um, and so cost control was a huge issue um, for the central observability team. Fortunately, with a Prometheus-based monitoring system, there's a, a bunch of different mechanisms that can help you reduce cardinality, uh, control costs, and improve uh, performance. So I wanted to talk about uh, a couple of these different mechanisms. Um, so starting with relabel rules. So relabel rules are a native Prometheus feature that allow you to drop um, labels or uh, metrics uh, client side. So typically, um, when you're using uh, some of these open open source exporters that Emma talked about, there's oftentimes uh, oftentimes metrics um, that you don't need. Um, you don't ever query them in dashboards or alerts. Um, and so you can safely drop them client side. The next two mechanisms, rollup rules and mapping rules, are features of M3. Um, M3, as, as I explained in the, uh, in the beginning, is an open source metrics platform that was developed at Uber, um, and it actually acts as the underlying metrics uh, platform at Chronosphere. So rollup rules allow you to pre-aggregate metrics before actually storing them in the time series database. So again, just as with rollup rules, oftentimes with with common exporters, there's usually labels um, uh, or tags that you don't necessarily need. And oftentimes, these labels uh, are, are very expensive. They have high cardinality, um, and you typically don't need to see, um, you typically don't need to break down your, your metrics um, by these particular labels. A, a common one is, is instance or pod ID. Um, so with rollup rules, you can safely aggregate them before actually storing them in the, the time series database. Mapping rules allow you to define the storage policies for each time series. Um, so this means you can downsample uh, a subset of your metrics um, and store them at different resolutions. So let's say your, your default scrape interval is 30 seconds, but you have a subset of metrics that you want to store at one minute. Um, what you can do is you can use mapping rules to, to do that. Lastly, we have recording rules. So recording rules allow you to pre-compute expensive PromQL expressions and then store those results in the time series database. So all of these uh, greatly improve um, performance, especially at query time, since now you're querying fewer and fewer time series. Cool, so I wanted to talk about uh, enablement. Um, I think this was probably one of the more interesting uh, pieces. Um, DoorDash obviously has a lot of engineers, a lot of teams, um, and so uh, enabling the users on Prometheus and teaching them about PromQL was, was one of the, um, I would say, probably more difficult um, but interesting aspects of this migration. So the first thing that we needed to teach users is how to best use the Prometheus data model. Um, because, it, because it's a tag-based model, um, and most of the engineering team was, was used to StatsD, which is a node or path-based model, um, we really needed to, to sort of um, teach them about all of the best practices. Um, and one of the main things was teaching them not to over-index on the metric name, uh, but instead use tags and labels to give context and meaning, meaning to the underlying time series. PromQL, as, as I mentioned earlier, is the Prometheus query language, and it has become sort of the standard in the industry for querying time series data, especially tag-based uh, time series data. Um, and so we had to teach uh, the engineering and, and service teams not only about sort of like the syntax and how to actually write these queries, um, but we also had to teach them about the quirks um, of PromQL. Two of these that I wanted to highlight are 
um, how you query counters, um, because with a with a running or cumulative counter, um, you need to apply a special rate function. Um, and oftentimes, um, and w one of the benefits, right, of the rate function um, is that it will actually interpolate or estimate um, missing data points. Um, and so we had to we had to really sort of you know kind of pull back the covers a bit on the rate function and. and um, especially with the more sort of technical um, or power users of um, of the of the system. Um, next, we had to talk about um, sort of how to query histograms versus timers. Um, so, with histograms, as you'll recall, um, you do all of the percentile calculations at query time, um, and you do this through uh, specialized PromQL functions. Next, not everything needs to be built from scratch. Um, because we now had a standard data model throughout DoorDash, um, what we could do is we could rely on open source dashboards and alerts and recording rules um, that we could just pull into the system um, and teams could just you know, get, get all of that visibility right out of the box. Um, even, with, even with service teams, um, we could build gold standard dashboards um, that other service teams could use as models um, for, uh, for building their dashboards. Uh, lastly, um, the DoorDash uh, Central Observability team decided to manage all of these resources through Terraform, so managing all the dashboards, alerts, aggregation rules, recording rules, things like that. Um, and so we had to come up with a, with a way for teams to easily onboard um, all of their different assets. Um, and then, of course, we had to give them the tools um, to make it easy to do so. The final part is about timeline results and learnings. Uh, let's say our timeline of the migration. Uh, our journey began in Q1 2020. That's the time that we decided to move away from STSD and toward Prometheus. And then in Q2 2020, we started the migration of infrastructure and the Kubernetes metrics. And it, it finished in Q3 2020. Uh, during that phase, we migrated all the uh, Kubernetes and infrastructure metrics, including like the Seattle weather metrics and notice powder metrics, and also um, the AWS um, metrics. Um, as I mentioned before, we used a lot of exporters as an, um, and we deployed the, the metrics collector as an agent um, in all our Kubernetes cluster. For the services that is now deployed in Kubernetes cluster, for example, like uh, EC2 instance, uh, deployed in EC2 instances, and also uh, ECS clusters, we deploy the um, metrics collector as a sidecar with a service to scrap their metrics automatically. So starting from Q4 2020, we started migration of service and uh, and application metrics. Uh, we finished all the metrics, dashboards, and alerts within one year for all the service teams. Then in Q4 2020, we deprecated the original Stacity pipeline and we only used some um, Stacity exporters and keep a lightweight of the Stacity pipeline. Yeah. Cool. So just uh, taking a look at some of the numbers of this massive migration. Um, so we started with more than 7,000 alerts, 1,500 dashboards, and metrics for over 130 services. Uh, needless to say, this was a massive collaboration across all teams uh, and engineers, especially Emma's team, the central observability team. One year post-migration, um, which also coincided with hypergrowth in uh, DoorDash's business, um, we now have over 27,000 alerts, uh, 2,200 dashboards, we're ingesting over 15 million metrics per second. Um, and then post-aggregation, we're persisting uh, just over 10 million metrics per second today. Um, so a couple of the learnings that we took away from, um, from this migration. Uh, the first one, switching from, per from percentiles to histograms is tough. Um, this was, you know, not not only was this a client side change, right, where we, where we had to sort of teach engineers um, about buckets um, and which buckets to select, the appropriate number of buckets, um, things like that. Um, but we also had to teach them about how to how to actually query it through PromQL. Um, and also, you know, obviously along the way, we wanted to teach them about some of the advantages, right? So now we could, you know. Now engineering teams, right, could get accurate aggregations across, uh, you know, uh, across instances. 
Um, next, the instance label um, is a important concern for overall volume. Um, as I mentioned before, the instance label is one of those um, is one of those super high cardinality labels um, that unfortunately gets added to every single uh, Prometheus metric. And this is to keep track of the unique metrics for the cumulative counters um, and histograms. Um, fortunately, with roll-up rules, um, we can pre-aggregate that, that instance label away and then safely store um, you know, a, a, you know, a, a lot less cardinality in the time series database. Uh, one of the important learnings is that Prometheus is now friendly with shell left jobs. So we use Prometheus aggregation gateway um, for for this part of metrics. And it could be dangerous because it's kind of like push model, and that is thing that we want to avoid. So we just limited um, the method to some special cases. The last uh, learning that I listed here is that uh, we really need to automate the monitoring onboarding process for teams. So in DoorDash, the steps are like, first we provide the, um, the service teams with wikis, which document how to like generate metrics um, uh, using the Prometheus native clients. Uh, we give them some examples to follow. Um, then after the service owner and the service team add the annotations in the Kubernetes manifest, which means their metrics, uh, their uh, service and the jobs are ready for uh, scrapping. Um, after that, we provide, with, uh, we provide them with some um, Grafana um, dashboards, Grafana templates for them to use and copy from. Also in Dollash, we provide the alert tools for the service teams to use. Um, they can use that to generate the alerts automatically. And we provided the alert template for some common alerts, for example, like the uh, Kubernetes container level health. Uh, we provided the alerts um, to, uh, to, monitoring, uh, to monitor like the um, Kubernetes container uh, restart count, CPU and the memory utilizations all those of these metrics, yeah. Awesome, so yeah, thanks for coming to our talk. Um, I think we'll take a few questions now. Um, and if you wanna talk to myself or Emma or anyone from the Chronosphere team, uh, we have a booth here at G15. Um, I think we're giving away some pretty cool prizes today. Um, we also created a video game uh, just for this conference, so you should uh, stop by and see if you can, uh, see if you can beat our high score. Yeah, so my question is that you mentioned there are 2,200 dashboards. You, uh, why you maintain that many dashboards? Don't you think <laughs> that you have to standardize or have similar set of dashboards? Yeah, so I, I mean, I think a lot of those, um, I mean, I think that like the original number um, of, I think it was like 1,500, I think a lot of those were probably still just kicking around um, and a lot of the, you know, a lot of the like Prometheus based ones, um, we probably don't have as many, um, which obviously you can, you know, tell it's probably about, you know, 600, 700 or so. Um, but you also have to remember like, I mean, DoorDash is a huge organization. Um, I'm not sure exactly how many engineers there are, but I would guess probably in like the thousand-ish. Um, and so, you know, you always have teams and, you know, engineers that kind of go off, make, you know, test dashboards or like, you know, personalized things. Um, um, but yeah, um, I don't know if Emma has any other comments about that. Yeah, I think we have a lot of dashboards there and yeah, in different buckets and for each team, like we have some like uh, Kubernetes container level metrics for them to use, but they also keep their own copy. Yeah. Hi. Uh, for someone who's just starting on this migration journey, what would be some mistakes that you would recommend that we can avoid? I mm. saw the learnings, but would love some more detail there. That's a good question. Um, I would say, I mean, I, I think the, the biggest thing that, 
and, and Emma could probably talk a little bit more from the DoorDash side, but I think the biggest thing that, that we found to be very helpful is really working with one or two sort of like, you know, pilot teams um, to sort of, you know, kind of get that, that model out there. Um, you know, especially around, I would say, like the use of the Prometheus clients. Um, I think having, you know, having a couple services, right, that are using each of the different like Prometheus clients, right, like maybe of one Go service, one, you know, node service or something, um, and sort of, you know, getting them sort of fully across the line um, at the beginning, I think that can really help because that you sort of learn, right, a lot, you know, in that, in that journey. Um, and then other teams can sort of, you know, tack on and, and, and follow that. Uh, yeah, so from my perspective, I feel like we really need to um, set the common text as soon as possible. Yeah, it's difficult to change, uh, like, y if you have other set of common labels, for example, like we have the cost, uh, we have a cost, um, cost origin like, that we really get, want to get rid of because we want to use a service app, uh, these two uh, combinations to um, find the service uniquely. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, so basically you provide the wrong standard, kind of like templates and everything, but it's actually just for the first generation, right? So like if the goal standard changes, how, how do you like um, ensure that all the teams actually follow the updated goal standard that you've provided? Like for example, like let's say that the cost of origin is like a new tag. How can I make sure that all the team actually gonna make it inside the tag as well? Oh, actually, for example, like the cost origin label, they are generated um, from the, from our side automatically. So in the matrix collector, we have uh, like uh, some uh, s uh, s shell script to get like AWS and uh, uh, AWS region and zone ID and also the uh, service name automatically set for them. So they are not able to change that, and we populate all the, the all these labels for them automatically. Yeah, I think that can vo avoid some mistakes, especially some spelling mistakes from the service team. Yeah, I think what, what we found, and, and honestly to this gentleman's point, um, I think having a central observability team sort of take lead um, in this migration effort was super beneficial because they sort of have a view right across the company um, and they can set those, those standards in place early on. Um, and so obviously things are gonna change right in the future, but the, the more that you can eliminate the, you know, the unknown at the beginning, I think the, the better. Um, so I think in general, you really want to look at what your scrape interval is. Um, I think that's like a pretty good, um, that's a pretty good standard to look at, right? So if your scrape interval is 30 seconds, right? Having, you know, jobs under 30 seconds probably not going to work, right? Because those jobs will, uh, will complete before, you know, Prometheus or the collectors uh, can actually scrape them. Um, so I think it, I mean, yeah, it, it, it really depends, um, but I, I like, for me, if I, you know, I'm just gonna say like a blanket statement, I would say like the scrape interval is probably a good um, sort of boundary. No worries, I, I heard. Um, yeah, the question was, uh, do we have plans to correlate um, uh, metrics, uh, time series data with, with traces, um, specifically around open telemetry? Um, so at Chronosphere, we actually just, uh, or last year we launched a, a tracing product um, where we do just this. Um, I, yeah, I don't wanna say like, I can't really talk about DoorDash. Um, but yes, we, we do have plans. Um, and we, we do have uh, customers uh, actively using that. Um, 
and you know using it to correlate right between metrics and traces. Thank you, everyone.